I, I have to start by thanking you, Kiana, for your very interesting talk uh, before lunch now. Uh, and I think a lot of the things that you brought up will be uh, recirculated and reused in the discussion that we'll have right now for the, for the coming 45 minutes, an hour or so. Um, I really do think it was fascinating. And I'm actually delighted to have all the three of you uh, with me up on the stage today uh, because at the National Heritage Board and at the state county administrations, we have uh, uh, quite a challenging task uh, ahead of us. We are working now um, uh, on a new vision for um, heritage management in Sweden until the year of 2030. And this is done by, it, it's been commissioned by the government. Uh, and they, in turn, want this as uh, uh, a, a starting point, you may say, for a coming government bill on cultural heritage. Actually, I think it's going to be the, the, first the first government bill ever only to address only cultural heritage. So this is quite an important, I think, step and quite an important moment in time uh, as heritage is being very much in the forefront of, of government policy. and, and uh, uh, as you see, we need all the advice we can get. So I'm very happy to have you three on the stage with me here. Um, it is a crucial time, of course, because it's a time when uh, people and ideas are moving across the borders at an incredible, incredible uh, pace. Um, I think that the latest figures from the UN show that 10% of the population of Europe was born in a country other than that in which they do live. So contemporary society is, of course, characterized by you know, constant change and very rapid change. At least it's perceived that way by, by people today. And this may, of course, uh, uh, be, be seen, or, or our existence may be perceived as being more complex and possibly even more threatening than, than in the past. At the same time, we can move, like you also talked about this morning, Ken, we can move between identities and we can choose to belong to more than, than one place at a time um, or to no place at all. So I think right in the face of all of these transitions that are going on, uh, the question that we need to ask ourselves is how our interaction with heritage, uh, with everything that people have created before us, can help us to explore our place in time. And uh, so I'd like to just take a, a, a round between you and, and, and ask you, um, do you agree that the speed at which people and ideas are moving around the world may affect the ways in which we manage and which we perceive the historic environment? Uh, and if so, in what way? Would you like to start, Arna? Yes. Um Yes, I do agree, and I think that um, it would mean that um, that the way you manage cultural heritage that it um, only gets more and more important uh, because of this. Um, and also, what what you talked about uh, earlier on, and also when I look at my own experience, is when I travel the world, world and I see a lot of countries, different cultures, different identities, different histories, also. I feel like I sometimes take different cultures with me, different identities with me. I appropriate it. Even certain parts of histories of other countries I take with me because I feel like I identify with it. <coughs> and um, I think this is a very nice thing. And as a, a cultural heritage um, board or agency, um, of course, um, architecture and cultural heritage has a big influence on the way people shape their identity. Um, and so you could steer the way people look at uh, the past and therefore the present, but also the future. And if you um, manage it in an open way and you give people the chance to, um, to appropriate it uh, uh, in their own way, um, I think that's, that, that's, that could be the biggest task uh, to do. So that people, when they would come here and they see all these different histories and identities, that they can take part in it. Exactly, That's it. it's an open uh, sort of view on heritage, yes. Kenan, what, would you, what are I, your reflections? I would be more cautious, actually, about the idea that we're living in a particularly um, 
in an age which is, which, which is changing particularly quickly. We certainly perceive it that way, but whether that's actually the case, I think, is less um, uh, straightforward. It's certainly the case, I think, that ideas spread much quicker, um, that the technologies we have allow us um, to, to think about ideas and spread them across the world in, in a way that wouldn't have before. But is the, the state of change in Europe, say, over the past 20 years, really more than it was in the beginning of the 20th century, with the coming of modernism, with the transition from the old Europe you know, um, uh, the, uh, to, to uh, the post-First World War Europe? Um, was that re you know, are we living, really living in a, ch in a, in a period that's changing with this, this greater change than, than then? Um, we perceive it to be so, and we perceive it as a problem. I think in the past, people would have perceived those changes as um, something to welcome. So if you go back to the 1920s and looked about how people saw the, the change, the coming of everything from new forms of travel, new forms of transport, um, new forms of art, um, and so on, um, people would have seen that as something to welcome much more than we do now. So I think the issue is, is not simply is, are things changing, but why do we fear change so much? Um, you talked about 10% of Europeans being foreign born. In France in the 1930s, if, if I'm right, um, uh, very close to that percentage of French people were foreign born. They, were from, they weren't from um, outside of Europe, they were from uh, Italy and Spain and, and Portugal. But they were seen often in the same way as we regard people from outside Europe now. Um, we talk about the migrant crisis and imagine that the, the, the numbers of refugees coming into Europe now is unprecedented. It's not. Um, there are, uh, even if you accept the, the, uh, the figures now, which are problematic, and they're problematic actually because refugees are double counted. Um, in other words, if you enter one border, um, are refuse entry and enter another border, you see there's two people. Um, so, and, and so the figures get inflated. But even if you accept the figures, which are about this year, um, about half a million um, have, have, have tried to come to Europe. Well, if you go back to think about um, after the Second World War, there weren't half a million. We were talking about five or six million displaced people. Then. If you look at the Vietnam crisis um, after the Vietnam War, um, something like two million people, um, half of whom were resettled in America um, in a very short space of time. So the point I'm making is that, is that it's not necessarily the case that uh, things are happening at a much quicker speed. Or, or it's just that we perceive it to be so, and we perceive it as a problem. And I think those are the two issues we need to address. Thank you very much. And you, you also gave us some clues uh, as to, to this. I, uh, I understand in your talk this morning that heritage institutions could actually shed some light on the fact that, that uh, these kind of changes and migrations and, and, uh, is, is not a new phenomenon. Actually, I think in the 19th century, wasn't it about 20% of the inhabitants of this country that left uh, for mainly for, for America and, and for those kind of dreams? And that must have sort of, of course, uh, had a lot of consequences as well. Maria. What is your uh, thoughts? No. What are your thoughts? <clears throat> well, I think I, um, I'm uh, somewhere in between both um, speakers here because I was also thinking that uh, maybe it's the faster way of communicating and that uh, ideas travel faster on that actually is the big change. And I think that uh, just as you uh, touched upon, Lars, uh, right now is that the importance on what we do that work uh, with the heritage management in different ways is to uh, create a, uh, a landscape where we show that first this is not something new. People moving and migration has been happening through history and we have the tools to actually make that uh, seeable and viewable and also that will I think be a way of making it not a problem but rather something to relate to, that this is the way society change. I also think that 
viewing this uh, will be important for the, move, the moving people to be a part of a new belonging. Whereas if you're not seen in the choices that we make in, in heritage management, you can't see that you belong where you are. So I think it's important for democracy that we that work in the heritage management uh, try to show the history of the world we actually are living in and not only, as we talked earlier, the uh, homogenized, the home site, the homogenic history. There is not one way of displaying history, there is many. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, the question of how to do this is, of course, the really, really interesting one. And, and maybe we can get back to that during the discussion as well, because uh, um, I think we, we're all, I see a lot of institutions now searching for, for the right tools and, and the right approaches to, on how to do this. Uh, and I, or no, I, I actually I read recently that while exploring the former the, the heritage of former Yugoslavia, you felt the need for for a sort of a new architectural language, mm -hmm. a new way of looking at the built environment, which is sort of liberated from or free from the burden of politics and ethnicity. Now, could you explain what, what, what is this language and, and yeah. what does it sound like? Yeah, then first it's important to explain a bit the situation of former Yugoslavia, because Yugoslavia is formed after the Second World War. It was a new country, um, and it actually consisted out of six different countries with all their mainly uh, own uh, religion and ethnicity. They had to be, be unified into one country, and the uh, socialist leader of that time, Tito, um, used the arts to do this. Uh, but they had to invent a new form language, uh, in, this, in these arts uh, to unify people. Um, so they used um, uh, fine arts, film, theater, but also building monuments to commemorate uh, Second World War uh, um, victims because uh, the Second World War, uh, every country of these six countries wa was a victim. So there was a common story to tell. Um, and these monuments had an appearance that was completely new. Uh, so they were brutalist, futuristic, abstract. They did not have any forms of religion, politi politi political preferences, uh, um, uh, nationalist uh, ideas or, uh, or, or ethnicities. So they looked completely new. There is not, an, there's not a single architectural object in the world that looks like this. So this is very interesting, this way of dealing with it. Um, but also some of the architects of, the mon of these monuments used um, uh, traditions and archaic and ancient symbols to tell something about what they, what they call the future. Um, so, and I tried also to learn from that, what, if, what if, if you're rebuilding a city, for example, in former Yugoslavia, because there are a lot of destroyed cities, if you're rebuilding a city and you're rebuilding actually identity and a culture, uh, could you use these traditions instead of using um, religious uh, or et ethnic symbols? Um, and by using these traditions, and it's not traditions that are ancient only, but traditions of activities that, that are common in a place. Uh, and, and, and that open language is based on these uh, traditions. So actually things that people do daily in, um, in, in, in their cities. Mm. That's, that's very interesting. It's, it, is it a way of recharging heritage uh, or recharging the meaning of, of uh, heritage? Yes, yes. It's definitely about meaning, yeah. giving new meaning that combines or actually that relates the past to the future. Exactly. Um, new meaning that is relevant to us. Exactly. Today and, yeah, and, and relevant for, for not only for us now, but maybe also for, uh, for our kids later on. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Maria or Ken, did you have a well, reference? It's just a, one thing that struck me when I was in um, Montenegro not so long ago. And one of the things that struck me about it was the number of Yugoslav flags that people had in their houses. And there's a, there's a sense I got, um, I don't know the area very well, but I, there's a sense I got that not for a, 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 um, a, a look back to Tito's times, but a sense that the, the, the frictions and, and factionism that, 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 um, that bedeviled the, the Balkans now, mm. um, p 
people look almost romantically back at, 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 at what they regard as, a, as an age of, uh, of um, universality, as an age in which people got on together. Yeah. Um, and so th th there seems to be kind of two issues here. One is the attempt to use the past to, to, to um, shore up differences, but also a kind of romantic attempt to use the past to say, actually, we're not that different, too, and yeah. both seem to be at play. Yeah, exactly. that's true. It's well, very interesting. Maria, what are your thoughts relating to museums uh, around this? Could this language be used in museums? Well, I think it's interesting the way of thinking of the parts of the cultural heritage as a language where we can actually open the book and read. And then I think it's important to think that we make it possible for everyone to use the words to read your own meaning. Because I think that we as working as professionals, we should not create, we should facilitate. It's a very big difference between that. Whereas architects or designers can have a different way because they create new landscapes. Um, and when we are doing that, trying to facilitate for many using the languages or the words, building their own, perceive the heritage their own way, I think it's important for us as professionals as facilitate as many different ways as possible to be able to do that and interact with the cultural heritage. Mm. Exactly. And do you have any examples, any concrete examples that you could uh, relate to or reflect around? On, on the built heritage, you think, in, in, in today or...? Yeah, you can pick any, any, anything you like. No, it's a, it's a tough one. You can, you can think about that. Example um, of what? <laughs> yeah, well, well, ex well let, let me put it this way instead. Um, I, I would like to think that heritage, or I think maybe rather the, the, the way we use heritage and engage with different aspects of, of the past, uh, is a part of, of sort of a quest for a moral compass. We've, we've been sort of touching upon that, I think, in, in the former Yugoslavia. How can, we, uh, uh, how can we connect heritage and, and moral issues? Uh, I'm not sure, Kenna, would you agree uh, that this is the case, that there is a connection between how we use heritage and the kind of moral compass that we need in a society that is truly diverse and vibrant and I'm not sure there's a straightforward connection. Um, we often use the past to present a particular moral view of the present. Um, and you can see that all the time. And I think that's quite dangerous. Um, the, the past then becomes a weapon in current moral discussions and debates. At the same time, it's very difficult to have a debate, a moral debate or a political debate in the present without appealing to the past in some way. Um, when we don't live just in the present, we're all formed out of the past. And therefore, I think you know, the difficulty is working out how do you appeal to the past to inform our debates of the present without use, turning the past, then, past into a myth about how the present should be. That's, I think, the, you know, and, and I find that a very difficult issue. And I, I'm sure, you know, <laughs> most people here would do too. I'm coming back to this with concrete examples. Do you have any concrete, have you been to a museum or heritage institution that you've, you've, you've thought to yourself, you know, wow, this is a really interesting way of, of, of uh, relating to heritage and using heritage for, to facilitate such a, a dialogue or reflection? Well, as it happens, the, the, the most interesting, most moving museum I've been to, probably in my life, was I was in South Africa recently. And it's a museum in Cape Town called the District 6 Museum. District 6 was an area of Cape Town which was uh, a mixed area. It was with, um, in apartheid terms, it was a combination of black, the blacks lived there, coloreds and, um, lived there, Jews lived there. It was, a, it was a highly mixed, vibrant area. And in 1966, it was declared, a, uh, under the Group Rights Act, a white area. And the whole place was just raised to the ground. And everybody was forced out into the townships and, and beyond. Um, and nothing was built there. 
it was left, I mean, it's, it, 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 in retrospect, it, it, it feels like an act of vindictiveness on the part of the apartheid government, that there was this area, a mixed area, very close to the city centre, they just wanted to erase, so, um, uh, and they've left it as rubble since. But the museum was truly moving because it was created by the people who used to live in that area. So their stories of what, what it was like, then stories of where they are now. So it's not simply, it was not simply a museum about the past and about victimhood, but also about human agency, if you like, about the ability to resist, to be able to change, um, and, and, and the importance of memory to that process of change. Um, and it's one of the very few museums that I've seen that, that does that so well. well. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. I think also a good example is the, I don't know if you know it, the Neues uh, Museum in, uh, in Berlin. Mm -hmm. It's made by uh, uh, David uh, Chipperfield. And what is really nice there is that it, it, it got, well, it got destroyed during the Second World War and then they rebuilt it after a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like um, a building that is peeled off with where you see all the layers of history they try to put in there. So you could uh, relate to different layers of, uh, of history. And that's a really uh, nice example. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, and I think a about your question about the moral compass, um, that a compass is, an, uh, is a nav navigation uh, tool. Um, so it helps you to go where you were wanted to head to. So um, first you need to know where you're heading to, to use the tool also. Yeah. So I think that's, and of course, that's why it's very good that you think of this 2030 uh, situation. Exactly. Exactly. Now, Orna, we've been talking about we live in this globalized world and, and change is, is a, a constant, but, but it's, it's always been, but, but change is very much perceived as, as uh, being very rapid and very, um, uh, very, very important. Uh, change is uh, as constant as preservation, probably, and the sense of belonging to one place is no longer taken for granted. We, we move between different places and we can sort of establish an ownership or, or, or relationship to different places. How does this new condition impact on the way our future cities are, are thought about and planned, and, and what could the role be for the historic environment in, in such a context? You've been thinking a bit about these mm -hmm. issues. Can you tell us a bit? Yeah, I think the historic environment has a very big role because also, Kenan also mentioned it a bit, that uh, if you now go to cities, uh, it does, doesn't really matter if you go to New York, Amsterdam, Stockholm, uh, we all um, go to the same coffee shops, we all go to the same uh, well, uh, shops, we have all the same skyscrapers, it looks like everything looks the same. And, and in a way it makes it that places are familiar for us, but in the other way it makes our worldview a bit flat. Um, so I think that's why cultural heritage is very important. But a city also consists out of, out of memories and um, it's all about reading and experiencing this city and this legibility is very important. This building upon the, the past in a new way, but building mm. upon and not erasing and putting something completely new. Mm. So I think that, that could be the role um, of her heritage. Mm. Heritage, uh, uh, since things are changing, heritage the, the meaning of heritage changes as well, uh, and some heritage they, loses its meaning because it's no longer relevant to us. Uh, after the factories shut down, after the, the factory workers that used to work there and the families no longer exist, you know, the, the ties grow weaker and weaker. And, and, and also you've been thinking a lot about recharging uh, heritage with, with new meanings, and I, I, I'm sure you'll talk more about that tomorrow, yeah. but will you just... Give us some reflections as to, to this. Yes, well, with, with RAF, our architectural studio, we actually documented all the vacant buildings uh, that belong to the government. And so a lot of cultural heritage is in there, buildings from the 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st century. So that's from churches till factories. Um, so we documented it and we showed how to, how to deal with it in different ways. Because normally you look at a building as in... Uh, uh, program 
uh, in search for a building, but you, now you look in a different way. Building uh, searches for program. So you have to think in the opposite way. How can this uh, building give new meaning to its mm. surroundings? And therefore you have to do very good cultural historical uh, research, but you could also link it to future ambitions of the, uh, on a higher level, so a national okay. or, or an international level. Okay. So for example, we did a project on a uh, military airbase. Um, and there we linked this new function with uh, the national ambition for 2030 to, uh, to, to green or, well, yeah, green flying for uh, new flying of the 21st century. Oh, so environmental friendly flying. Exactly, so, yeah. yeah. So mm. in, that, in that way we get things also done quicker because you, um, well, it, it, also, um, it also helps this national ambition. So it's good to link different skill levels and, uh, to each other in that way. But that means you have to think and do research in a very layered uh, way. Exactly. Maria, do you have any reflections around this? With, yes. With, uh, yeah. <coughs> I'm, I'm also thinking that you said in the beginning that um, the use of heritage and the change is constant, of course it is, and it's, it's as old as preservation, as you said. But I can also see that through history we can see the reuse and the revalued um, built uh, historic environment, but also artifacts, how we have used and reused that all the way up to the, uh, the modernity. And then we started in the Western life to tear down and build new instead. And that is a change in how we, through thousands of years, have reused our built historic environment. And I think that in times of uh, the need for uh, a sustainable development, we have to go back to being more able to have a broader view on using and reusing the cultural heritage and the built environment. And I would say that uh, in, in terms of, of doing that, I think that we will also have to have a much uh, broader view on how we preserve, because we can't, preserve, we can't freeze history. We have to make the using uh, continue over time and not stop history by preserving. Oh yeah, right. Uh, s but maybe we can show all the different layers, like yes. in the Neues Museum exactly. in Berlin, mm -hmm. and, and make those. If we make yes. those visible, we open up for many different, uh, more interesting, you know, discussions and meetings and talks and, and references to to the heritage. Kenan, right. you look, look. You have to say something now. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking here as a not not as a heritage professional yeah. or a policymaker, but, but somebody somebody who visits museums or yeah. who who um, uh, likes history. You know. And it seems to me that, that part of the problem is it's difficult not to be didactic. And to be, being didactic is a problem. That, that is, that there's a tendency for museums or um, cultural preservers um, to want to tell a story to teach a particular lesson. And that's as problematic if, you want to, if the lesson you want to teach is history is complex yeah. as if it is that history is simple. I, yeah. I, I think that it's the didactic aspect of it that's the problem. Mm. And so, in a sense, what's important is, is, is to engage with ambiguity. Um, when you were talking about a building where you can see the different layers, what, 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 what's coming out there is the ambiguous character of both of history and of the present. And it seems to me the, the more we think of less about lessons or, or st even stories, but of ambiguity, the more we can think about how to use the past in a non-didactic, in a, in, a non, um, in, in a way that doesn't force us to think in particular, along particular lines. Exactly. I, I remember when I was a museum director myself, I, I had a quote from Winston Churchill that I used to look to every now and then. It said, I'm always ready to learn, but I don't like being taught. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was a pretty good one, actually, for, for uh, not to underestimate your audience and not, not to, to oversimplify things either. Uh, I think mo moving on, um, I think we like to see the... Uh, 
the historic environment as, as a democratic space, something that everybody can relate to in their own way. But how can we as, as heritage managers make sure that everyone who wants to be a part of the Swedish society uh, uh, can feel that they have access uh, to the historic environment, that, that each one has the right to use and, and to explore uh, the heritage in, uh, in their own terms, whether he or she was born here or not. Uh, is, is this, an, is, is this an, uh, a question that we need to raise today? What do you think, Arna? I think it is, but it's a very difficult question. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe a way uh, with dealing with it is to let different people participate in the way you manage uh, um, cultural heritage. Maybe that's a way. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's a very difficult uh, question. Yeah. Maybe it's also about... Um, well, not, ab not about education in a way that you, uh, that you only educate uh, people, but for example, it's sometimes al also by, um, by, by making people see invisible layers of this heritage. For uh, an example, for example, in, in, in Holland there's this uh, problem that, uh, that a lot of people that are originally completely Dutch always think that, that Moroccans uh, that immigrated in, uh, in the 1960s, that they, that they are part of our history since 1960, but they don't know that our trading relationships with Morocco go back to the 12th century. So if you show these invisible uh, historical layers, people will get a broader view of, uh, of the world they live in. Yeah. And, um, but I'm, I'm not sure, it's a difficult question. Yeah. Maria, do you have any... Mm -hmm ideas on how to... Well, I think I've, I've started to feel like a parrot, but I think that it's important to be able to facilitate for everyone, right? And that's what you're asking, how do we do that, actually? And I know the problem that we are dealing with now is how not to work too much about, uh, to be not too much political, no, too much, not too much non-cultural, but just think as everyone. But how do we know that we reach everyone if we can't actually pinpoint different groups? So it's not an easy way even if we want to. But I think that the awareness that we should have as professionals, as long as we are aware of what we are doing and why we are choosing, because as we spoke earlier, we are always making choices. We can't free ourselves. I don't think that there is an objective way of working with heritage management because we all make choices, uh, we give grants to some, we uh, list some buildings and things like that, or we excavate or we don't excavate and things like that. So, uh, if we are aware of the choices that we make all the time, but also are speak freely about them, and, and I was thinking of the example that you, got from, uh, that you gave from South Africa, I think it's important to, to use the positive there, where history actually can inspire change, because that's what I'm thinking, that what I thought I heard you said. Whereas you can actually look upon history and see that as a way of understanding ourselves and our own society. Exactly. Can I? I'm wary in some, certain ways of, of that question, because it's asked all the time. And the answer to it is often something that's very patronizing to the audience. It's as if the audience won't come to culture, therefore you have to bring culture to the audience. And there's that sense. And, and, and it's, it's a kind of patronizing view of the audience and um, what they want. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a debate in, in Britain about Shakespeare and how to make Shakespeare relevant to today, and you make Shakespeare relevant today by turning Shakespeare into the, into the lingo street talk. Now, that seems to be hugely patronising of, you know, of young people of today and their relationship uh, to culture. So I think we just need to be wary in asking that question that we don't patronise the audience we want to attract. Absolutely. Mm, I'm sure there are many cases. I, I, actually, I know a few myself, and I probably stepped into that trap a few times myself, where we, we with the best of intentions, mm. 
uh, invited different groups to the museum and we told them, this is your heritage, now look at it, be happy, you know, and, and they were interested in other things, you know. So, so sure, we absolutely, I think we need to be aware of that, but uh, at, at the same time, it's, well, it's a complex world because, uh, and because I, I think we, we, we're also, at least in the, in the, um, in the, in the heritage management, the cultural environment, we, we're dealing with legislation and, and things like that that have, are, are, is quite old and it's, it's fashioned on you know another idea of the world, and we're still uh, actually using that kind of legislation today because changing legislation is a slow process; it takes time, uh, and 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 other aspects of what we do are, are moving ahead. So we, I think, we need to to be able to work uh, in a very complex society where we need to uh, work with some of the tools that are very old, we need to work with some of the prejudices that we all, I think, in, in many ways still have. And we also have uh, a duty sometimes that we, we, we can't control ourselves to report further on to, to politicians or, or people who give grants and so on, on, on a different, in a different way. So, and, and all this, you know, we have to we have to be able to put together into into a, a working whole, which is not easy all the time, obviously. Well, and this, I guess, um, touches a little bit on uh, on uh, one of my final questions. I, I think that if if we agree that the exploration of historic artifacts and environments can in some way help us to understand the present. Uh, what then should be the criteria for our preservation practice? Are the things that we have missed or the things that we don't need to bother with? How do we choose which sort of stays and what goes? That's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Any, any reflections? I can, I can start. Yeah. I'm thinking that this, Lars, is uh, one of your biggest conquests ahead. And I think that we probably in this room and everyone else listening to this and working out in the fields agree on the notions of a globalized world migration, a pluralistic way of seeing history, etc., etc. But I think the big work we have to do now is actually making that tools for practice in agencies, in museums, because we are, many of us are struggling with tough economic situations, uh, fast decision making, and we have to make the practical heritage management to work all over the country. And I think that is the biggest and most important work ahead, is to actually find those practical tools for making it possible. Exactly. Orna, do you have any reflections? Yes, uh, I, I do agree with what you say. Um, but I think it's also important to think also, what narratives do you want to tell? And then you also know what to preserve, in what way do you want to uh, historicize a building or a site, or do you want to tell a new story? Do you want to um, reveal invisible layers, or do you want to make a connection with future use, um, or with bigger uh, ambitions of the governmental ambitions? Um, but it also means that, that you shouldn't be too careful with <coughs> dealing with heritage. Sometimes it needs a very radical approach to tell a different uh, story. So it also deals, of course, with these rules that if you're doing stuff, um, dealing with it with rules that are very old, then maybe we should come up with new rules for it. Mm. Uh, of course, the, the who, 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 is, who tells whose story is uh, at the heart of, of some of this uh, uh, very interesting discussion. I think it's a it's a very difficult one. I think we are I think we're running a little bit out of time. Uh, I wanted to ask you basically one last question. Um, 
what is the most important way from your different perspectives in which heritage management could contribute to an open and inclusive society in 2030? What should we at the National Heritage Board and at the state county administrations be really careful to consider when we are, or, or, or together with a lot of you here today and, and a lot of institutions are working on this, on this vision that we are going to, to uh, submit to the government in March? Can I? Well, I would go back to the point I was making at the end of my talk, which is, I think, the role of heritage professionals is not to create certain symbols, it's not to create certain myths, it's not to preserve particular histories, it is to open up the debate, it is to show our past as contested and to show that contestation is a normal part of, of human societies and that, and that a contestation now, conflicts now, are actually not to be feared but to be engaged with. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a heritage professional, so I can't give you in concrete terms how I would do it. But that to me, I mean, it might sound abstract, but that to me is the way I would approach the issue. Yeah. Um, I think but but to me, as more of a heritage professional, I can say that it's, it's, not, it's not so easy, Kenan, because mm. all the objects are they're loaded with, you're, all the objects that re exist already is, is loaded with meaning. And, and whatever the heritage professionals do to these objects is going to reload load them perhaps with another meaning, but it's still going to be the heritage professionals who manage this transition unless you, you come up with some extremely clever way of doing this so that perhaps, none of us has thought about. Perhaps the issue is not the, are not the objects themselves, but their relationship to the audience. So what, you need to, what you're thinking about is not so much how do you present an object, but how do you um, uh, create um, uh, make space for a debate around it. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's a different kind of question, I think. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. But that's something that museums do more yes. and more, I think. Yes. Make space for debate, make, make space for meetings and, and uh, for, uh, for in, uh, uh, including uh, part participatory work and stuff like that. Right, Maria? No, I, I, I agree. I think that we have to uh, facilitate for many different views of the object presented and, and start a debate about that. And also I think actually one of the most important things is that we, as working as professionals, are aware of the choices that we make and why we, why we do them. Because we can never free ourselves from, we can never be objective. Objectivity is impossible, I would say, because we are always working in a political context or a but maybe we should be less afraid of conflict while, while yes, we're doing this. Absolutely. Can I give one concrete example? Sure. Actually, it comes from Britain again because that's what I know best. But um, it's been the anniversary of Magna Carta, mm, yes. and Magna Carta is one of the kind of great myths about of, of Britain: the, 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 the roots of uh, democracy, the roots of tolerance, the roots of etc. 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 But at the same time, Magna Carta is hugely important, hugely important as part of British history. And so, it's, just because it's part of a myth doesn't mean that we should ignore it or, or not think about it or celebrate it or not, not celebrate it. We should, but at the same time, we should use it as a way of debating those myths, the place it has in British history. Um, and I think you know, it's doing both that matters. Thank you very much, Ken. I think it was also very clarifying. Orna, would you like to add something to, to um, this discussion? Or yes, I think, yeah. I think it's, all, it's about, of course, objects with a, maybe sometimes a loaded history, um, but it's also about meaning, meaning that these objects had, have and could, could yeah. have in the future. So maybe it's also about rethinking what this new meaning could, uh, could be. And I actually, I found this very nice quote of uh, Tariq uh, Ramadan, mm -hmm. um, and it's maybe also a bit uh, abstract, um, but by perceiving uh, heritage, we should not focus on the multiplicity of observers, but we should focus on the common object that is observed and then try to grasp the diversity of points of view via the essence of their similarity. 
Exactly. That was some very, very nice words. And I, I just uh, can't help to, to re relate to the fact that, that I think the UNESCO and other organizations are now starting to use heritage. You know, we've all been seeing what's happening to heritage in, in Iraq and Syria and so on, the, the destruction. But parallel to that, that, there is also some work going on using heritage uh, for building, actually, understanding and trust and... and um, uh, and, and moving on in, in reconciliation processes where you can actually, through heritage and through these myths, perhaps you know, uncover some of these myths from, from different sides. Uh, I, think, I know it's been done in Mali, for instance, and, and certainly in other places as well. I think this is very encouraging as well, that, that heritage can, can have that, uh, that meaning and that use as well. I want to thank you very much for sharing the stage with me, very much for, uh, for giving us this input for, the, for our future process, uh, feeding into the, the, the work with the vision. And uh, I think we should give Arna and Kiana and Maria a very warm round of applause.